Um, as I said, good evening. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company. We're delighted to welcome uh, Patrick DeWitt to the bookshop uh, tonight. Scandal hit widow Frances Price has been cast out of New York high society while her indecisive son Malcolm seems incapable of breaking free from his mother's influence to the great frustration of his long suffering fiance. With little left for them on the Upper East Side and accompanied by their cat, Small Frank, they set sail for Paris, a city replete with meaning and history for them both. French Exit might be described as a comedy of errors, except that anybody familiar with Patrick DeWitt's work will know that he only straps himself into the straitjacket of genre because of how much fun he has busting free of it. So it is with French Exit, a withering critique of contemporary society that also somehow manages to be heartwarming. An affectionate book about the eccentricities of mothers and children. A book about money and how it shapes us. A book about holding on and letting go. In addition to French Exit, Patrick DeWitt is the author of The Sisters Brothers, which won the Governor General's Award and the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, and was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize and the Walter Scott Prize. The Sisters Brothers has been adapted for cinema by Jacques Odia and is out in cinemas in France, at least, tomorrow. Patrick DeWitt is also the author of Ablutions, which was a New York Times editor's choice, and Under Major Domo Minor. Nell Zink said, the first time I read French Exit, I raced through, impatient to know the fates of its characters. Then I turned back to page one to enjoy Patrick DeWitt's understated satire and casually brutal wit. And the New Yorker wrote that DeWitt's surrealism is cheerful and matter of fact, making the novel feel as buoyantly insane as its characters. While NPR called French Exit a sparkling, dark comedy that channels both Noel Coward's wit and Wes Anderson's loopy sensibility, adding, these people you may not want to invite to dinner, but they sure make for fun reading. Please join me in welcoming Patrick DeWitt to Shakespeare and Company. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So we said we'd begin with a yeah, shall little read a reading bit? to, to okay. set the tone. I don't think I really need to set it up because I'm just going to start on page one. But this, well, what do we have here? These are uh, the primary characters, Frances Price and her adult son, Malcolm, are leaving a party, okay? <clears throat> All good things must end, said Frances Price. She was a moneyed, striking woman of 65 years, easing her hands into black calfskin gloves on the steps of a brownstone in New York City's Upper East Side. Her son, Malcolm, 32, stood nearby looking his usual broody and unkempt self. It was late autumn, dusk. The windows of the brownstone were lit. A piano sounded on the air. A party was occurring. Frances was, was explaining her early departure to a similarly wealthy, though less lovely, individual, this the hostess. Her name does not matter. She was aggrieved. You're certain you have to go, she asked. Is it really so bad as that? Frances said, according to the veterinarian, it's only a matter of time. What a shame. We were having such a lovely evening. Were you really, the hostess asked, hopefully. Such a lovely evening, and I do hate to leave, but it sounds an actual emergency, and what can be done in the face of that? The hostess considered her answer. Nothing, she said finally. A silence arrived. To Frances's horror, the hostess lunged and clung to her. I've always admired you so, she whispered. Malcolm, said Frances. Actually, I'm sort of afraid of you. Is that very silly of me? Malcolm, Malcolm. Malcolm found the hostess pliable. He peeled her away from his mother, then took the woman's hand in his and shook it. She watched her hand going up and down with an expression of puzzlement. She'd had too, too many drinks, and there was nothing in her stomach but a viscous pate. She returned to her home, and Malcolm led Francis away, down the steps to the sidewalk. They passed the waiting town car and sat on a bench twenty yards back from the brownstone, for there was no emergency, no veterinarian. And the cat, that antique oddity called Small Frank, was not unwell, so far as they knew. Francis lit a cigarette with her gold lighter. She liked this lighter best due to its satisfying weight and the distinguished click it made at the moment of ignition. She aimed the glowing cherry at the hostess, now visible in an upstairs window, speaking with one of her guests. Frances shook her head. Born to bore, she said. Malcolm was inspecting a framed photograph he'd stolen from the hostess's bedroom. She's just drunk, he said. Hopefully she won't remember in the morning. She'll send flowers if she does, said Frances. She took up the photograph a recent studio portrait of the hostess. Her head was tilted back, her mouth was ajar, a frantic happiness in her eyes. Frances ran her finger along the edge of the ornate frame. Is this jade? I think it is, said Malcolm. It's very beautiful, she said, and handed it back to Malcolm. He opened the frame and removed the photo, folding it in crisp quarters and dropping it into a trash can beside their bench. 
He returned the frame to his coat pocket and resumed his study of the party, pointing out a late middle-aged man with a cummerbund encasing a markedly round stomach. That man's some type of ambassador. Yes, said Francis, and if those epaulets could talk. Did you speak to his wife? Francis nodded. Men's teeth in a child's mouth. I had to look away. She flicked her cigarette into the street. Now what? Malcolm said. A vagrant approached and stood before them. His eyes were bright with alcohol, and he asked in a chirpy voice, Got anything to spare tonight, folks? Malcolm was leaning in to shoo the man when Francis caught his arm. It's possible that we do, she said. May we ask what you need the money for? Oh, you know, the man raised and dropped his arms. Just getting by. Could you please be more specific? I guess I'd like a little wine if you really want to know. He swayed in place, and Francis asked him in a confiding voice, Is it possible you've already had something to drink tonight? I got my edges smooth, the man admitted. And what does that mean? It means I had a drink before, but now I'm thinking about another. Francis appreciated the answer. What's your name? Dan. May I call you Daniel? If that's what you want to do. What's your preferred brand of wine, Daniel? I'll drink anything wet, ma'am, but I do like that three roses. And how much for a bottle of three roses? A bottle's five bucks, a gallon's eight. He shrugged as if to say that the gallon was the shrewd consumer's choice. And what would you buy if I gave you twenty dollars? Twenty dollars, said Dan, and he whistled a puff of dry air. For twenty dollars, I could get two gallons of three roses and a weenie. He patted the pocket of his army coat. I've already got my cigarettes. The twenty would set you up nicer then, wouldn't it? Oh, quite nicely. And where would you bring it all? Back to your room? Dan squinted. He was realizing the scenario in his mind. The weenie I'd eat on the spot. The wine and the cigarettes, I'd take those into the park with me. That's where I sleep most nights, in the park. Where in the park? Under a bush. A particular bush? A bush is a bush in my experiment. Experience, excuse me, he said. Francis smiled sweetly at Dan. All right, then, she said. So you'd lie under a bush in the park, and you'd smoke your cigarettes, and you'd drink your red wine. Yeah. You'd look up at the stars. Why not? Francis said, would you really drink both gallons in a night? Yeah, yes, I surely would. Wouldn't you feel awful in the morning? That's what mornings are for, ma'am. He'd spoken without comedic intent, and Francis thought that Dan's mornings were probably wretched beyond her comprehension. Sufficiently touched, she opened her clutch and fished out twenty dollars. Dan received the bill, shuddered from skull to toe, then walked off at an apparently painfully brisk pace. A beat cop approached, looking after Dan with malice. That guy wasn't bothering you two, I hope, he said. Who, Daniel, said Francis? Not at all. He's a friend of ours. It seemed like he was putting the bite on you. Francis stared icily. Actually, I was paying him back. I should have paid him back a long time ago, but Dan's been very patient with me. I thank God for the fact of a man like him. Not that it's any of your business. She held up the lighter and lit it. Click. The flame, stubby and blue-bottomed, was positioned between them as though defining a border. A sense of isolation came over the cop and he wandered away, asking sorry small questions to himself. Francis turned to Malcolm and clapped her hands together, communicating a job is done sentiment. They disliked policemen. Indeed, they disliked all figures of authority. Have you had enough? asked Malcolm. I've, answered Francis. Walking toward the town car, she took up Malcolm's arm in her special loving creature manner. Home, she told the driver. The grand, multi-level department was dim and resembled a museum after hours. The cook had left them a roast in the oven. Malcolm plated two portions and they ate in silence, which was not the norm, but they were both distracted by personal unhappinesses. Malcolm was worrying about Susan, his fiancée. He hadn't seen her in several days, and the last time they'd spoken, she had called him a rude and vulgar name. Francis's concern was more existential. She lately had found herself mired in an eerie feeling as one standing with her back to the ocean. Small Frank, elderly to the point of decrepitude, clambered onto the table and sat before Francis. She and the cat stared at each other. Francis lit a cigarette and exhaled a column of smoke into his face. He winced and left the room. Malcolm said, What's tomorrow? Mr. Baker insists on a meeting, Francis answered. Mr. Baker was their financial advisor and had been the executor of the estate after the death of Francis's husband, Malcolm's father, Franklin Price. What's he want? asked Malcolm. 
He wouldn't say. This was not technically a lie. Mr. Baker hadn't stated explicitly what the meeting was about, but Francis knew all too well what he wished to discuss with her. The thought of it made her morose, and she excused herself, ascending the marble staircase to curry solace in a bath choked with miniature pearlescent bubbles. Afterward, she sat on the settee in the bathroom in her plush robe, and her hair was down, small Frank sleeping at her feet. She was speaking with Joan on the phone. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I had this feeling when, when reading it, and, and again, just um, just listening to you, then that the, it's, it's rare actually to begin reading a novel and meet two characters who seem so entirely fully formed. Mm. Um, I mean, there's such a sort of a, a richness to their dialogue, and even though we don't get any particular sort of physical description of them, we don't even get to hear that much of their uh, internal monologues at uh, at this point. There's something so so clear and so distinct, and we feel as readers that we know them almost immediately, okay. um, which makes me wonder about the the genesis of the characters and more generally um, the book. I mean, did the did the characters of Francis and Malcolm come to you almost as fully formed as as they come to us? Um, in this case, it's not always the case, but in this case, I did sort of get them pretty quickly, mm -hmm. and in terms of. Um, showing the reader um i want i'm glad that that was your experience getting to know them quickly because that's sort of the goal one of the goals whenever i set out to write something whether it's a short story or a, a novel i want to think of the quickest way mm -hmm. just get all that stuff over with um i think most of my favorite books are similar in this way. You just sort of jump into something and, and you understand right away where you're at. Mm -hmm. um, Trust the reader to, to fill in the blanks. To sure, it. yeah, yeah. But um, dialogue is such a good way. I mean, that's how we get to know people, so mm -hmm. I find it's a really good way to get to know uh, fictitious characters as well, mm -hmm. just the way they speak and, and what they do and do not say, you know. Mm -hmm. And once you, w once you had these characters, I mean, uh, did they come out of a, a desire to write about this subject matter? Because, I mean, we see mm -hmm. from your from your biography that you uh, you live in Portland, so you're not a, uh, a New, Wealthy Yorker. New Yorker. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering what drew you to the the sort of the Upper East Side high society as a as a topic. I think it's um, my first book was about me or somebody like me, mm -hmm. and um, the, the 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 process of publishing that book and then discussing that book and discussing the autobiographical uh, elements. Um, and people wanting to know how much was me and at what point does this book become fiction. Mm -hmm. That was all really tedious and it made me uncomfortable. Um, so I've avoided it since. So typically I'm, I'm addressing um, a world that I don't know intimately. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, you know, something like um, Sisters Brothers say, these people, their experience is so far from my own experience, but that's a really, from the point of view of a writer, it's really fun to... to, to a, act as a voyeur, and then B, to, to fill in the blanks, as you say, um, wondering what it would be like to be a wealthy New Yorker, wondering what it would be like to be a contract killer. Um, I just find that it, 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 it the, the, my not knowing somehow isn't an impediment to the process. You'd think that it would be, but it's actually really nice to just sort of have this blank canvas and then fill in what you think it would feel like, what mm -hmm. it, you know. And then um, being on the outside looking in, I think I feel that way generally in in my life. Just sort of, um, I feel like I'm more of an observer than a participant. So it's sort of a natural, um, you know, feeling that way fe feels natural and good to me. Mm -hmm. And it's not an entirely or at all sort of unloaded uh, slice of society to look at as well. I mean, as soon as you talk about sort of uh, incredibly moneyed. Yeah. New York high society, um, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's somebody reading the back of the book and, see, you know, finding what the subject matter is or whether it's what, reading about this uh, this level of society in the newspapers or, or whatever. Yeah, it, it's going to provoke certain certain feelings, probably a lot of uh, certain disdain. I mean, you make you think of the kind of the 99 percent sure. and the one percent. Was that something which you felt you had to do you experience and you felt you had to overcome to get to know these characters? I don't think I necessarily overcome it in the text, but I did have to overcome it, I think, in my mind. 
And when I submitted the book, I said to my editor in the U.S., I think this is the, the stupidest time to write a sympathetic <laughs> portrait of wealthy people uh. in the history, certainly <laughs> in North America. Like this. And I was expecting a lot more animosity and hostility mm -hmm. to come my way, and I'm sure there's some coming. But um, so far, people have just sort of accepted accepted the you know the uh, as a work of fiction and, and of course i'm not championing uh wealthy people by any means but if the book's successful like if i succeed then you will have some kind feelings for these people mm -hmm. and maybe they're people who don't necessarily deserve it so they sort of earn it through entertainment um, or that's the <laughs> idea that they earn it i mean if somebody makes you laugh it's hard to dislike mm -hmm. this person mm -hmm. um Anyway, yeah, n not a uh, not an intelligent time to write write this story, <laughs> and I don't really understand um, how it came to be. But um, I find I don't really consider my work. Uh, you know, I don't consider what the response will be until sure. it's too late. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know why that is. I should probably think of it beforehand. But then that might be. Uh, that might sort of retard the process mm -hmm. for me, so maybe it's better not yeah. to think about it at all. I think also there's this, this sense of sort of if you, I mean, I guess the, the easy approach when writing about the sort of the high society would be to, to go after them, to have a sort of, yeah. a, sort of a, a ruthless satire, not yeah. just of the, the society itself, but of the, of the people yeah. within it and sort of exposing their flaws and exposing them. Yeah, and I think that that's done to an extent, mm -hmm. but really it is a very loving portrait, particularly of Frances, who, who mm -hmm. is just, you know, kind of as mean as can be. She's mm -hmm. just a really vicious... Um, reptile, <laughs> and yet you know, I I I have a fondness for her. Mm -hmm. It's it's difficult, I think, to talk um, about Francis and Malcolm separately in a way. It's yeah. they kind of they I don't know whether you'd sort of describe sort of Francis as sort of the planet and Malcolm as the moon, the sort of orbiter. But there's definitely some sort of um, inherent sort of sort of unbreakable connection between them, and not just the sort of unbreakable connection that probably exists between any parent and and their child but just the, the way that their their lives have have developed yeah there seems to be this kind of extra yeah um, yeah it's a unique um bond i was thinking of my own parents and what's happened in my experience is i've i'm 43 and i speak to my mother probably every day um my father is working on my house right now or renovating my house together and it's weird, you know, it's uncommon. And I know that most of my friends don't really understand it. Mm. But so anyway, I've, I've, I've aged and I've continued to spend time with my mother and father and our relationships have evolved. And now we're much more sort of like peers. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, yeah, I was speaking, sort of taking a poll amongst my friends and most of them divorce themselves from their parents when they move out at 18 mm -hmm. or whatever, whatever year it is. And the relationship never really recovers, mm -hmm. the, the more common thing to happen. So I feel fortunate that I, that I have this uh, relationship with my mother and father. But I also, in terms of, you know, writing about that, it seems that this is not a hugely common dynamic. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not covered that often. So th not that Francis and Malcolm have a particularly, you know, healthy relationship. I don't think that they do at all. But there's some root love there that. I wanted to see more of, mm -hmm. so, and that was definitely one of the inspirations mm -hmm. for writing the book. Do you think part of the um, the affection you as a writer feel towards Frances, and part of the sort of I concur the, the affection we feel towards her as a reader as well, is to do with the point in her life at which we we meet her? Yeah, I mean, there's a um, there's a moment where I think. Uh, if I remember rightly, sort of some somebody's talking about the stage of her life. She talks about it being the third act or even the the coda. Like there yeah. is there there is a sense of once somebody reaches a certain point, um, I don't know. They're they're almost easier to to love. Yeah, I think that if we'd seen a portrait of her when she was sort of at the height of her powers, she would probably have been much less sympathetic. But mm -hmm. the fact is, the book opens on what is the last stage of her life, and it's a meaningful stage for her. But there's a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of disappointment and, um, you know, really acute bitterness. So I think that we're more inclined to give her a chance because mm -hmm. um, she's a little bit down and out. Mm -hmm. And that's and that's it as well, because, of course, her life up until up until this point has been incredibly privileged. Yeah. I mean, born into a rich family, married uh, into even more wealth. Yeah. And was able to live in this incredibly luxurious life. Yeah. And yeah, at the point we meet her, um, I mean, she talks in 
in the extract that you read about having the having an appointment with her financial advisor. Yeah. And I think it's probably not giving too much away. To no, I don't think so. Yeah. So she, her money's gone. Her money's gone. That's sort mm. of the the, the, the mm-hmm. this man's chasing after and. We don't really know why, and then he sits her down and just explains that she's completely broke. So that's the um, inciting incident, I mm-hmm. guess you'd say, in screenplay chatter. And um, the rest of the book is just her reaction to and recovery from uh, the realization mm-hmm. that she's broke. And then, and then there's this, this sort of, I guess it was surprising to me as well when, when this revelation takes place, not to experience a sense of kind of, I guess, schadenfreude at how... Uh, and it, you know, sort of how how the mighty fall in yeah. a way that even though we'd already got to know that yeah she was quite uh, had been quite unpleasant with other people was still quite unpleasant with other people. You yeah, felt, there was, you felt sympathy. Yeah, 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 very much, and that sort of surprised me. Yeah, if you didn't feel that way, that wouldn't have been wrong, you know. Um, I'm imagining some people are reading the book with 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 some Schadenfreude, mm-hmm. and that's okay. I think it's healthy. <laughs> but let's talk a little bit about Frances then in her in her younger years, as we get to sort of know bit by bit yeah. um, during, the, uh, during the event, and that's, uh, during the novel, and specifically uh, her relationship with uh, Franklin, her, her husband. Now, immediately sort of as a, as a, as a reader, your sort of your attention pricks when you see the sort of the, the, the wife called Frances, the, uh, the husband called Franklin, like a sort of a yeah. suggestion that there's, it's almost like a, a yin-yang relationship. It's almost two halves. It is, yeah, the same and then yeah. Small Frank the Cat, is, he plays a role as well. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, Frances, in her younger years, was just known as a great wit and um, as a great beauty and sort of like a style icon, something along the lines of, say, like a Jackie Onassis mm. or somebody like that. Somebody who was sort of famous for being famous. Um, and then Franklin, her husband, who is, I'd say, mostly deceased uh, in the in the book, <laughs> um, he was known... First, as just a successful litigator, and then as a as a, as a truly infamous mm-hmm. and immoral litigator. And this was the type of character you see in the news in, in the United States quite often. This is somebody who defends the indefensible, mm-hmm. uh, the tobacco industries, and and, and um, you know the war 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 apparatus, and and, and um, anyone doing anything bad for money. Uh, Franklin was there to defend them, and, and he was just <laughs> quite a you know a mad dog in that way. And he excelled, and so people wonder, you know what's the moral motivation for this person and um yeah so when he dies uh, uh, francis and, and franklin had a had a, had a, had a I, I think of it as like a very passionate mm-hmm. and, and probably in the start a very loving relationship but it sours over time as uh, franklin devolves and she can't you know respect him mm-hmm. and um there's evidence of it in the book um I'm, I'm later on i think that she she really hates him mm-hmm. in some way and she credits him with her disappointments in life mm-hmm. I think she sees herself as somebody who could have been any number of things. I mean, uh, and then she wound up sort of being famous as the widow. That was like her, her, her sort of uh, her her place in the world was was to be the widow of a of a bastard, really. Mm-hmm. So, and and we get the we get the sense. I mean, there's a lot of relationships, whether it's between uh, husband and wives, or fiancés, or parents and their children. Particularly within this uh, within the Price family, there is a lot of there's a lot of poisonous, or not poison, poisonous might not be quite the word, but a lot of very, very difficult, troubled relationships. So whether it be Francis with her mother, Francis yeah. with Franklin, um, uh, Malcolm with, with Franklin. But interestingly, between Francis and Malcolm, um, that seems to be the one relationship from that family that is oddly devoid of bitterness. Yeah. Uh, despite the fact that um, in many ways, uh, whether it be with his relationships or or, or how how she treated him when when he was a boy, you know, she Francis has acted to kind of stimmy Malcolm's life to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 again, it's not it's not really the healthiest relationship, but I think that they both, um, each one is so devoted to the other, and 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 um, you know, there's a space in Malcolm's life and in Francis's life that can only be filled by the other person. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I'm not sure what it is for Malcolm necessarily, but I think Francis is just, uh, has been looking for a reliable companion all of her life. Mm -hmm. And she has it in her friend Joan somewhat, but but not really to the depth that she requires. I mean, this is somebody with very deep feelings and lots of things to say. And um, 
she suffered from loneliness, mm -hmm. I think, all of her life. And so, yeah, she just looks for sort of the answer to all of her um, questions and problems in her son. And as a result, he doesn't have much of a life uh, yeah. for himself. But I think he's willing to give that up for her. It seems like he never really complains about it. I, and, he, yeah. and he follows her to, to France and mm -hmm. would have followed her, I think, anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, Malcolm didn't know his mother and father when he was young. He was in boarding schools all of his life. So she finally comes around and sort of takes him under her wing and, and, and won't let go. And he's, he's more than happy to, to, mm -hmm. to, to tag along. And one of the um, one of the things that Malcolm leaves behind is his um, his fiance Susan, yeah, as well. And it's sort of like you get the sense uh, very early on that she's his his long suffering, <laughs> yeah, uh, fiance. I mean, she uh, their relationship is described as being in a holding pattern, yeah, um, at a particular moment. And and she also reflects. Um, there's this <laughs> wonderful sentence: "He was a pile of American garbage, and she feared she would love him forever." Yeah. Um, and then, sort of like it's a again, there's this odd sort of triangulation to their relationship as well as having sort of he has managed to to meet somebody and to to at least sort of build up a pr pretense of a supposedly normal conventional relationship. Yeah. And yeah. she knows for for every good reason that she should not be with him, and yet there's something mm -hmm. that draws her to. Uh, to Malcolm as well and I was just wondering if you could speculate on quite what it is that means Susan is so attached to Malcolm well yeah I think she has bad taste in men <laughs> and I think that um, there's something uh, I've known people somewhat like Malcolm mm -hmm. and in spite of their you know seeming uselessness it's, it's he does have a unique point of view mm -hmm. and that's uncommon and so I think that Susan is involved in a in a scene of people whereby she's very rarely surprised mm -hmm. and um malcolm is many things but one of them is surprising he says and does uncommon things mm -hmm. and um and then you just can't really choose who you fall in love with too sure so yeah. uh, some of us are just doomed to love people <laughs> that aren't necessarily good for us that line um the copy editor wanted me to take out the word american so that it would just say garbage because mm -hmm. they're in america and she sure. said we don't need this because we're in america <laughs> But I prefer it with the American mm -hmm. garbage. It's a very particular type yeah, yeah, of, yeah. of garbage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is the uh, this is sort of sort of condition we um, we find them in. There's a, um, a moment where you say they're both distracted by personal unhappinesses. Right. Um, and we've mentioned also they they come to Paris, and we'll, we'll we'll get on to Paris in a moment. But the manner in which they come to Paris, I think, is also kind of important and connects to the final line. I think the final line of the extract that you um, you read about talk, uh, with her back to, she felt like she had her back to an ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, it struck me because they, they don't fly to Paris, but they take a cruise ship right. to Paris. And then there's a moment on the cruise ship where um, somebody in, informs Francis that the, the water beneath them uh, is about five miles deep. Yeah. And Francis reacts quite, uh, quite badly to that, actually. The yeah. idea of being sort of, I guess... Be, being so exposed or being so sort of in va faced with something yeah. something so vast and it, it really struck me while reading through the novel that the sort of the sense of oceans and water and either being sort of, have, having some sort of vast depths beneath you or in the case of Malcolm there he's talking about being sort of cradled by the water and sort of surrounded yeah. uh, by wetness and I was just I was just curious about that sort of yeah, the, the ocean. Was it a, intentional? Yeah. Th this is the most interesting or one of the more interesting things of, of publishing a book is you do what you do and, and, and you don't really consider it or, or, or ask yourself why. And then after the book comes out, then people point out things that are true about the work that you hadn't necessarily. I'd never thought of that. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I don't know. I, I try not to think that I, I work on the level of subconscious, but I guess everybody does. I like to think that I'm aware, mm -hmm. but I'm, it's proven over and over again that that. that that I am doing things, uh, the left hand doesn't know what the right is doing, sort uh -huh. of a thing. So I must have been aware of, uh, of the, the water theme. I'm thinking of it now. There's quite a lot of them in my work generally. I'm a Pisces. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> That's but, yeah. an easy get out there. <laughs> yeah, but in, it, it doesn't mean anything, uh, mm -hmm. you know, beyond the fact that I must be fascinated by it in some mm -hmm. way. So, But yeah, I read that somewhere that the ocean at its deepest is, I think, four and a half miles, and that just seems like a horrible, horrible thing to know. Mm -hmm. And it is that kind of thing that might inspire that sort of existential dread that yeah. that Francis seems to be um, experiencing at this point. Yeah. This point in her when life. I started the book, it's funny because I, I sat down to write a book that was going to be 
similar tonally and in terms of style to my last two books, Under Major Domo Minor and Sisters Brothers, which both take place in the past. And I sat down to write a third book that was going to be like that. It was going to be about an explorer like Magellan or Columbus. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think I even got a page out. I had all the books lined out, research books, and I was all ready to go. And then I, I just didn't want to do it because I wanted to write a contemporary book. Mm -hmm. I wanted to return to a contemporary setting. And I did that arguably, but um, it's also, I mean, none of them have cell phones. They take a boat to Paris. <laughs> There's all these really sort of antique uh, elements to it. Mm -hmm. But this is as contemporary as I can get, I think. But and it's not cutting edge. The the experience of Paris as well is a is a kind of very uh, old fashioned. Yeah, quite a sort yeah. of a, quite a sort of picturesque Paris. So yeah. the the flat they they take it's on the Ile Saint Louis. Yeah. Um, looking at is it looking over the Place Dauphine? I think or so it's sort of looking over. It's look, it's like right on the very far end of Ile Saint Louis. Like um, if this is the island, it's right like the last. And there's a park. Um, I can't remember what the park's called. It has a... I can't remember the type of tree. Anyway, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful little park. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of tricky because all those scenes taking place in the park, I was here for four months some years ago, mm -hmm. and I lived in the 10th um, near the Gare de l'Est, and mm -hmm. I, I looked out. I was staying in what had been an old monastery, uh -huh. and I looked out over this park. But I And now all these things that happened are things or were inspired by things that I saw. So all of his window gazing is, is stuff that was sort of from my journal, <coughs> uh, most of it anyway. Mm. But I didn't want to place that there. And so I, I figured out, um, this is not an interesting anecdote. I don't know what I'm <laughs> telling you. Sorry. I moved the, the, the apartment um, to the Ile Saint-Louis. But in fact, the what he sees when he's gazing out the window, in a, in a sense, it's a sort of uh, a glimpse into the kind of the unpicturesque Paris, mm. which... Yeah, well, it's, it's it's real. I think it's like they're not really. They go to great lengths to avoid um, real life. Mm -hmm. They just sort of turn their back on what the world really is, and mm -hmm. they've decided to sort of create their own world and live within this bubble, which is fine. But um, yeah, if you look out your window, you you will be confronted by what's actually happening mm -hmm. in the world. So it's 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 far more complicated than than um, what they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And 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 f Paris has a certain resonance for for both um, both Malcolm and Francis. In fact, yeah, uh, like they both spent time here. Yeah, at she spent sort of like her her her, her glamorous um, years. She was she spent a lot of time in Paris, and they both speak French, and it's just a bonding point for them, and it's a place for them to sort of disappear mm -hmm. uh, within. Um, I came to Paris however many years ago, and I was sort of hell bent on not enjoying it. <laughs> I had, somebody made me come. And um, I, I just had other places that I would rather go. And I just had this feeling that, you know, I didn't want to engage in that whole writer in Paris thing. But then as soon as I got here, I liked it so much. I was just sort of <laughs> screwed. And I continue to really enjoy um, just the way I feel here. Mm -hmm. I feel differently here than I do anywhere else yeah. in the world. And I don't know why. There was, uh, there was a nice line talking about Malcolm's experience of Paris where you say it's, it's his first knowledge of uh, worldliness. Yeah. And so sort of, I think he came when he was just at 19 or something like that and yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. It was and it learning was the language was really empowering for him mm -hmm. and, and and um yeah i mean really i just wanted to write about paris so i just made them like paris uh -huh. this is what you do <laughs> and then you can write off the trips here it's tax deductible mm -hmm. now because i've written about it so <laughs> and and up until this point we talked well, mainly about um francis and malcolm we talked we mentioned a uh, small frank but one thing that happens when they're they're here is sort of almost against their will yeah. They kind of attract a a group of of people around them. Yeah. And th there's a moment, um, I'm not going to give it too much context because it might give away too much, but there's a moment where one character asks uh, another, have you fallen in with a mad cast of plucky down at hill characters? Uh -huh. um, and that wasn't somebody addressing Francis, but it could almost have been yeah. at this point. It's kind of that, you know, they there's something about the way in which they arrive in the city and the way they act when they're in the city, which, I don't know, it does something for their solitude. It does something I for think their so. loneliness. I think so. And then just the, the, the fact of being somewhere that is not your home, you 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 just you behave differently. Mm -hmm. And this stems from a sense of freedom and, and, and um, maybe a, a lack of consequence, mm -hmm. I guess. I mean, there's consequences everywhere, but they're less readily apparent, I think, when you're on the move. Mm -hmm. Or when you're just outside of, of, of your home, like your actual the domicile, you know. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, you just feel freer, I suppose, so that they, they get bitten by that bug. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the other ways in which I guess um, Francis curiously starts to feel freer is as the the comparatively little money she comes to Paris with yeah. slowly depletes. I think it was a bag of one hundred thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, something like she that. She had in a bag when yeah. she when she came, and and she finds ways to. Um, she to sets about getting rid of it as fast as she can. At one point, she flushes money down the toilet. Mm -hmm. um, I think she sees it as a finish line that she's just really keen to cross, mm -hmm. and the reasons are sort of dire. But um, money is obviously representative of something ultimately very negative. I think, mm -hmm. and, and and you know, vacuous for her. So um, it's important f for her that she. Um, finds a way clear of it you know mm -hmm. there's a moment where somebody um sort of, sort of says about the amount of money she's spending and she says you you're supposed to spend it all that's yeah. the that's the object of the game it's sort of yeah so there there yeah there is this sense of sort of like almost in in getting rid of the money as quickly as possible she is trying to hasten a hasten her own demise her yeah own demise, i think yeah. so i think so um yeah, I'm, I don't want to give anything away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's difficult to, for certain things, got to sort of yeah. sort of talk around it. But I think um, one thing we do get from her, and I think this is one of the sort of uh, interesting things, and perhaps one of the the things that sort of meant that you avoided the the um, the kind of criticism that you expect as sort of writing about 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 these kind of people is that that you do examine the sort of the the privileges and the freedom which which wealth gives you actually mm -hmm. um, I mean there's a sort of sense that sort of up until up until a certain point because of the the life she's been born into Francis and to an extent Malcolm can live a, almost a consequence free life like this yeah. sort of sense of uh, because of this cushion of money that they can ultimately fall back on yeah they um, yeah they, they will act in different ways and they'll do things differently yeah and I think that's something that works on so many different scales as well you don't have to be uh necessarily a billionaire to uh to recognize that sort of to recognize the uh the protection that a certain yeah yeah and it's not it's not like a moral book i don't think of myself as a moral artist but i think that there is kind of a a, a painful lesson to learn mm -hmm. like i don't they don't get away scot-free you know no. <laughs> i don't think and um yeah i didn't necessarily want to take anyone to task mm-hmm but I think it's important to recognize. It was important for me to recognize that that that, that the the consequences were real for them. Mm -hmm. That they're not going to just sort of ride off into the sunset and burn money all the yeah. while, you know. <laughs> I mean, you you say it's not a um, a moral book, and I think it's. I, I think you, you're right in this. It's not a sort of a morally prescriptive book, yeah, by any means. But I think there's definitely. Uh, it's 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 a morally questioning yeah. book. I mean, sp I think particularly again from um, from Francis. I think there's sort of the idea of what it. Not necessarily what it means to live a good life, perhaps, but what it means to live a life well. Yeah, um, is something which, uh, b perhaps, because of the because of the stage she finds herself in her life, she's sort of she's questioning whether um, whether she's lived well up to this point. And whether yeah, yeah, and I, I I guess yeah, I shouldn't say that there's no moral because it winds up sort of bleeding through. But it's like uh, on my list of things to not do, mm -hmm. not to judge my characters or to. Um, punish them necessarily or praise them if they do something heroic or it's something that I sort of willfully avoid but I do think it sort of arrives. A mm -hmm. point of view is there whether I want it to be or not. Mm -hmm. And was this a uh, and I'm very conscious actually there's going to be questions from the audience so I'll make this my last one for now okay. but um, was this a point of view which you would have necessarily articulated at the start of writing the book or was it, uh, did you sort of take a journey with Francis and yeah. with Malcolm as yeah. well. Yeah, I uh, I don't plot things out and I just sort of take it day by day. Mm -hmm. So I, I really didn't know where it was going to wind up. The very last sentence of the book, I wrote maybe like a third of the way through the mm -hmm. writing of the book. But this is a sentence that just it doesn't really describe anything. It's just oh. Malcolm walking through the square at Sansal Peace. Um, and it's just a description of what happens when he splits through the crowd. And I don't know why that had to be the last sentence, mm -hmm. but it had to be the last sentence. I had an idea. So I was moving towards that very, very vague mm -hmm. point in time. Um, but other than that, I didn't really know what was going to happen. And I, and I, 
the climactic scenes at the end, I, I, I did change them so that they were anticlimactic. Uh -huh. You know, I, 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 I mixed it up. Um, but this is just what I came up with, what, it, what, what seemed was the best, mm. the best way to go for these people. Mm. Okay, on which note, I'm going to hand it over to you. If you have a question for Patrick, I see a few hands already. We'll begin with the gentleman just there since he's closer to the microphone. Thank you. Hi there. Thank, hi, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for the talk. Thank you. Um, just a, just a, first a, a small note. I mean, you've you got the Francis and the Franklin and the Frank, and then you've got the France and the French. And they're in France, uh, yeah. Know, so yeah. Kind of all ties yeah. together. Anyway, uh, I haven't <laughs> read it, but uh, I'm looking forward to it, so I don't know if it's any good. But, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. You, you, you've sold we'll it well. See. Yeah. But, uh, but, but I'm just wondering how close to the wind you're sailing when it comes to kind of cliché. Uh, and how much you can avoid. I mean, you, 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 the, the, the piece you, you read in the beginning, you yeah. know, you're very close to, you know, satire, satire plays with cliché. It's kind of an, yeah. a staple of satire. You need to, sure. you know, to, to use that a known thing. How much does that then happen when you come to Paris, which, as you hinted, is as before, cliched as can is, be. Is, uh, you know, we are here in the most cliche of, of, yeah, yeah, of yeah. bookshops. Yeah. Uh, and, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Take that mic off. <laughs> a, very, a very nice cliche. Wonderful to be here. Yeah. But, you know, and, and, you know, Americans in, in, in Paris is, is fraught. It's a very well-trodden path. Huh? Yeah, so I know what you're do, saying. How do you avoid that? If, well, if you I, avoid it, I don't know. There's I actually don't. a line. I, I don't avoid it. And I actually, in this book, more than any of my other books, I sort of intentionally jump into cliche on purpose. And... Um, I'm going to find this one line because Fran I was aware of everything that you're saying and um, enjoying it. There's something that's really, for me, sort of joyous about engaging with cliche and then ideally or hopefully feeling like you've triumphed over it or you've addressed it in a way that's new. Um, I'm not going to be able to find this now. Anyway, she, uh, she's, Francis is well aware of her own relationship to cliche and god damn it i can't find it i will find it here we go um so her friend joan comes to visit her and is angry at her for threatening to kill herself she's threatened to kill herself and uh joan and her are walking around france Francis asked her what was the matter, and after a stuttering start, Joan expressed contempt for the suicide note, the idea of suicide from a woman such as Francis, the cliché of someone so bright and promising killing herself once the glamour has passed. And now Francis speaks. Well, for one, she said, that's an extremely shitty thing to say to me. Two, the glamour passed a long time ago, and you know very well that it did. And third, three, yes, my life is riddled by clichés, but do you know what a cliché is? It's a story so fine and thrilling that it's grown old in its hopeful retelling. So, I think, um, thanks. I think uh, 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 there, there's something about doing something that you know has been done probably too much. And sometimes it feels bad and sometimes I don't know why, but it feels really good. And I'm never one to judge. If something feels good, I do it. And um, so I don't lament it. But... Um, being, you know, brand new or being completely unique just has never been that thrilling to me or that important to me. Like newness, I'm wary of newness because newness becomes oldness really quickly. Um, but oftentimes cliches are cliches for a reason. And if there's a way to sort of inject some of yourself into something that's well-worn and then you feel ownership of it, even though it's been borrowed and handed around so much, um, there's something thrilling about that for me. So, Are there a question just there. Hello. Uh, Hi. Thank you for coming. I read the book. I loved it. Um, I wanted to ask quickly, if we, uh, without spoiling too much of the book, about some of the supernatural elements. Oh, yeah. um, whether they were foreseen for the start or they crept in and what their inclusion means for you? Yeah. I think also there's a through line through all my work is that usually at some point there's a ghost or there's a something happens where there's something uh, some supernatural element in my work and this is stemming from just a personal interest but then also a fear of these things. I do have a tendency to address things that I'm afraid of and um, I have had experiences where I've seen ghosts in my life and it's stayed with me and, and, and troubles me and it makes me think about death in a way that is not... Um, 
anyway, it's just like this troubling thing that, that, that I have that keeps coming up. And there's something about, um, you know, when you write a book, you're, you're, you're playing God in a way, I don't really like to put it that way, but you, one of my great joys is putting people that I'm curious about, characters that I'm curious about or that I care about, into um, situations where they don't know what to do, and then just figuring out what it was they would, what, what are they going to do in such and such a, 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 an environment or experience. And um, you bring the supernatural into this, and I think it's really a good way to get to know these people and, and, and to, 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 for me to deepen my relationship with them. Um, ultimately, the, the supernatural stuff, and I've sort of decided actually after this book that I should really stop uh, at least for at least one book. <laughs> but um, I don't know. It just, it just sort of holds sway over me. I, 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 don't know, I don't know really why I can't let go of it, but it's just something that, that, that's on my mind. But meaning, yeah, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. <laughs> Some more questions? Yeah, over there, we'll just run the microphone to you. So just sort of a follow-up on the uh, writing in Paris question, because I think um, I have students here with me. We're all reading um, writing by Americans in Paris in the 20s. Okay. You know, between the wars. And I'm wondering, it's almost, it seems to me also almost impossible to write a story of wit and money and the uh, clash between the ideal world and the real world and so forth without invoking a lot of the things that those writers were getting at. And I'm just wondering if they're part of your library or where you see yourself fitting in with uh with that tradition and how mm. it's how it's carried on you yeah, know yeah. Uh, over basically the last century yeah well i was raised in a house where all that stuff that all, uh, writers in the 20s was very much my father reads all that stuff and still does and he has a just a sort of an ongoing fascination with all of it and i have a sense of you know you want to rebel against what you've been raised with and at a certain point, I, I, I sort of turned my back on all those authors um, in a sort of belligerent way and, 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 and wanted to find new authors, and I, and I did. Um, but I have in my heart a real affection for all that stuff. But I find when I look at it now, it just doesn't really doesn't do what it's supposed to do anymore. Um, not to detract from that great body of work, but... It was just part of my process of becoming the reader that I am now. I, I had to walk away from all that stuff, you know. And I'm a big fan of, of like, quitting things and, and moving away from things that once meant a lot to you. I think it's an important part of trying to avoid stasis, you know. And I think I felt a sense of stasis when I was reading that stuff. Um, kind of a long, rambling answer to a basic question. But... Yeah, yeah. I, th I think th I think that that's important to read all of those people, um, but I think it's also important to recognize how much more there is. And I'm sure you have. I'm just saying, like, I, I needed to recognize that, so it was good good to know them. And I'm glad to say goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more question. If anybody would like to, oh, there's one. There, that's too much. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I have a question about the Sisters Brothers and the film that's coming out this week. Um, I know you've written a screenplay before, and I wanted to know um, if you collaborated much with Thomas Biquin on the film, and also um, what your impression of the film is. Okay. I'm not going to be able to look at you when I talk to you. <laughs> I am talking to you, though. Um, so the, the screenplay is written by Jacques and Thomas, and... Um, we were just talking about this upstairs. I saw the film about a month and a half ago in Los Angeles, and I was it, it's 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 a really big thing to process for a, a, a writer. So many um, nothing was wrong, but there were so many things that were sort of different because there's only one way to deliver these lines in my head, and none of the actors hit that note because they can't because they don't know what's going on inside my head. So it's a process of um, accepting. Um, just the differences. I admired so much about it the first time around, but it was kind of shocking. So I couldn't really watch it the way you want to watch a film. And then I saw it again about a week and a half ago in Toronto. And this time around, I, I enjoyed it so much more. And um, it was far less shocking. And I could just sort of enjoy the experience of seeing the movie. And, and um, 
I didn't necessarily feel any uh, ownership of it. Um, I felt removed in a way that wasn't unpleasant somehow. I did a, a, a dialogue polish at the end, but really I had I had minimal input, and uh, Jacques and Tomas needed to be free to do the film that they had in their mind. Um, I think it's really uh, just an honor to have somebody like Jacques to, to, to film a book of mine, and I'm just really pleased about it, to tell you the truth. I feel very lucky. But it's a complicated thing. Um, you can't just sit down and, yes, this is great. It's like there's so much, there's a lot to digest and there's a lot to um, sort of work through in a way. And just to, to conclude on that with the, um, obviously having a, a, a French team and a French director working uh, on your work, did you, I mean, you've spoken about your affection for Paris. You've spoken yeah. about sort of the, 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 the effect that Paris had on you. Did you sense a French sensibility in the, the film? Movie. To me, I did. I don't know if I could necessarily verbalize it, but... Yeah, there's... I mean, Jacques is such a stylish individual, and his aesthetic is so evolved, and I think that's all there. It's really rich in detail, mm -hmm. and, uh, like, sensory detail, and then also just the details, like the clothing and everything. It's just... Um, it's really like a feast mm -hmm. in a way that I would say is, is, is very Jacques, and Jacques very French. Yeah. So, yeah, I would, I, I would say that there's... Yeah, it's, there's some there's some French stuff in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and on on the subject of, of that, actually, I believe um, I don't know if you know this weekend uh, in Vincennes, uh, there's Festival America, which is a big festival of, of uh, North American literature, and not not just North American actually, but Central and South American as well. Uh, Patrick will be there. I believe that they ha they have a screening of the Sisters Brothers, I'd, and perhaps with you speaking, is that? What uh, I'm going to be. Um I think after there's a, a Q and A. Mm -hmm. I think so. So that's uh, otherwise the film is on general release from tomorrow as well. Um, but do check out Festival America. We'll be there if you want to come and visit us in the Salon du Livre, selling uh, the English language books of all of the of the different authors that are there. If you haven't already read the the Sisters Brothers before you see the movie, you'll be delighted to know we have plenty of copies available at the front, as well as all of Patrick's. Uh, Backlist, uh, Ablutions and Under Major Domo Minor. And of course, uh, piles and piles and piles of French Exit, which uh, I don't think I need to sell to you anymore after the uh, <laughs> the great job that Patrick has done. So um, Patrick will be here signing books. Do stick around, have a glass of wine with us and join me one more time in saying thank you to Patrick DeWitt. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. I did. A, I, my, my last reading in Paris I did, there was three people there, so it's really nice. <laughs> that you guys came out, so I appreciate it. <laughs>